life, but no weapon has been located. The true crime story that sent shockwaves across the country. All of us are shaken. Four murders and then the guys just running around on loose is a little unnerving. The victims, four college students. Ethan, Zena, Madison, and Kaylee. I miss her smile. She was so giving. Positive and fun and we love her and miss her so much. Now, a PhD criminology student accused of the murders. How's it going, Brian? What are you doing? Detectives arrested 28-year-old Brian Christopher Kohlberger. Hello. How are you doing? How are you all doing today? Every inquiring mind wants to know why. Why would Brian Kohlberger do this? The maximum penalty is death and or imprisonment for life. Do you understand? Yes. Plus the evidence. On that knife sheath was DNA likely left there by the killer including those 12 times when he's hanging around this house you better have a pretty good reason for this guess what the defendant the suspect the accused what does he drive a white Elantra. The way that we have been convicting Koberger is absolutely appalling and disgusting. I want all the evidence out. I want it to be clear. If I'm the parent of one of these four kids, he is the boogeyman. I try not to think too much about any of the darker side of the aspects. I just try to stay positive. There'll be days where I have to focus on the negativity, but today is not one of them. I miss her smile and that she was, she was so giving. When she came home, she was always giving me a hug, always making sure she got a hug before she left the house. Just the simple things. These girls were born 14 days apart. We loved them both so much. It was a great, great story, and I'm sad that it ended, and we lost them both at the same time. I'll never see this car as mine. She paid for it. She felt like this was a super cute car. It was emotional riding with Steve in Kaylee's car on her birthday. We saw that vehicle at that home each day inside the crime scene tape. Kaylee and her friends Madison Mogan, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin were stabbed to death at the University of Idaho. And that car was part of the reason Kaylee was in town that weekend of the murders. When she bought her car, she was, she, she it wasn't her birthday, but it was a gift that she gave herself because she just got a new job, so. I remember her being super excited for that and, you know, showing Maddie and driving down there and showing her friends off with it. Those friends, Kaylee, Maddie, Zana, Dylan Mortensen, and Bethany Funk, all lived together in the house on King Road, along with Kaylee's dog, Murphy. Murphy, you've been a bad boy! There's a video of all five of the girls together in the home posted just two weeks before the murders. They're laughing, making fun of each other, imitating each other. Did anybody do their chores today? I'm just gonna do it. You didn't get, get out of here. You seriously got to get out of here. If you look back at their moments, you can actually see their whole lives. These girls really did do the social media stuff. Get down, get down. And these girls, you know, they were everywhere. So people got a taste and a look and a feel of who they really were. I think people connected with that. And then if you go back, you can see like, I hate to say it, but like the last hours of their lives. Those last hours included two photos posted by Kaylee. On one of them, she wrote one lucky girl to be surrounded by these people. According to investigators that last night, Ethan and Zana go to a party at the Sigma Chi house. They're there till about 1.45 a.m. that morning. Maddie and Kaylee go downtown, downtown Moscow, to a bar called The Corner Club. And then about 1.30 a.m., they walk to a food truck to grab a bite to eat. And then what was the night? Don't forget to the shit. Carbonara. The carbonara. Back of the weed. Here, I'll grab it for you. And then click see rewards. Enjoy. And it looks like you do not quite have enough points yet. Oh, that's okay. That's good. 
So about 10 minutes later, the video shows Maddie reaching to grab the food they ordered. Kaylee has her cell phone up as if she's filming the moment. They're laughing with each other until you see them run out of the frame. By 2 a.m., all five girls and Ethan Chapin were back at the house on King Road. In just over two hours, four of the six would be dead. Here. My name is Chief James Fry with the Moscow Police Department. I'm going to be reading from my notes today because I want the information you received to be extremely accurate. The four were stabbed with a knife, but no weapon has been located at this time. There was no sign of forced entry into the residence. Based on details of the scene, we believe this was an isolated, targeted attack on our victims. Right away, I think everyone knew this was going to be a big story. I mean, you've got four college students taken down at once inside the same home, and the chief comes out pretty quickly and, and says, listen, no forced entry here. This was a targeted, isolated attack. So most of us thought it should be solved pretty quickly, but that's not what happened here. Did make sure we clarify, okay. have them restart or restart the speed or... We arrived in Moscow just days after the murders, and you could immediately sense that this was a community on edge, and you could understand why. Four young people have been brutally murdered, and nobody knows why, and nobody knows who's responsible. I actually met a group of professors from the University of Idaho. They were out for a bike ride, and they really summed up what the community was going through. It has deeply affected all our students and our faculty and our staff, and it's been just a struggle to to get through this last week so how hungry is this university this town for answers very much so uh the fact that there isn't an answer is makes makes this even worse you know all of us are shaken i've heard from people all across the country talking about this tragedy it's a small college town we all know each other people in the community knew these students so everybody's affected one way or another and part of it's because we just don't know anything yet we also met the prosecuting attorney bill thompson any new details nothing that i can share how was the crime scene um I can't talk about it. That's Everybody's cool. working together. The, the investigation is still active, absolutely. Yeah, how long are they going to stay here at the home? Don't know, Thompson? as long as they need to. I ended up sitting down with Bill Thompson in his office. And remember, they had not identified a suspect, and a lot of people were wondering, are they going to solve this? And it was one of his answers to me that made me think they know a lot more than what they're saying. Would you feel safe having a child living near or on campus? I would, um, but I say that knowing that many people would not. And I'm probably in a, I'm not probably, I, I'm in a different situation because uh, of the information and the knowledge that I have of how the investigation is progressing. Coming up, weeks go by without an arrest. Just your mind has to spin like, okay, what is going on? Some people can commit crimes, and uh, there is no justice for that family. What the families and public didn't know about the investigation. Partly under her body, partly under her comforter, on her bed, likely left there by the killer. Moscow is a very typical university town. It has a, a vibrant downtown with places to eat, places to drink, places to gather. There's not really much surrounding Moscow, um, rolling hills of just wheat fields and various other farms. Small town feel. Um, I think it's roughly 25,000 people, give or take a couple thousand. I think of North Idaho as a pretty off the map type of place, pretty safe place, very family friendly, and to have four murders and then the guys just running around on the loose is a little unnerving. Weeks after the murders of Xana Kurnodal, Ethan Chapin, Maddie Mogan, and Kaylee Gonsalves, no arrest had been made. To the point that a lot of the students there on campus had cleared out because there was this fear among the community and even some of the victim's family members had fears that the investigation was stalled. Different things and that's why they told me to slow down, Steve, you know, this thing 
you know, you, you me as a, as a father, it's never fast enough, and I want to just charge ahead like a, probably just like a dumbass, but that's what I knew. What the families and the public didn't know was that the detectives had some significant evidence and leads, including DNA and a potential eyewitness. At the time of the murders, according to investigators, Kaylee and Maddie were on the third floor of the house in Maddie's room. Kaylee's dog Murphy was across the hall in Kaylee's room. Ethan and Zana were a floor below. Across from them was Dylan Mortensen, and on the first floor was Bethany Funk, who was in her room. Dylan will be a key witness in all this because she's on the same floor as two of the murders. And she opens her door three different times. Now, the first couple of times, she really didn't see anything, but she was hearing voices. Maybe it was the dog. Maybe somebody was, was crying or something. She wasn't quite clear what she heard. But the third time she opens the door, she sees this tall figure dressed in all dark colors, and she noticed his bushy eyebrows. And then this man walks right past her. Imagine what it would be like to be a young woman who opens the door and sees this man all in black and all you really see are his eyebrows and he's tall and he's big. And he just killed four people with a knife. He walks right past you and out the door. How close to death were you? It gives me shivers to just think about what that is. And that must just roll through her head every single day. Yeah, that's going to stick with a jury. According to investigators, Dylan described herself as being in, quote, frozen shock when she saw a man inside her home in the middle of the night. She was so scared, she locked herself in her bedroom. But the thing that raised eyebrows is that nobody did anything about it. In fact, 911 was not called until noon the next day, about eight hours after the estimated time of the murders. Some people, when they're very frightened, they just shut down and they tend to isolate and hide and basically it's a safety, seeking safety response. If she had been drinking or under the influence of something, she might have just shut down because she really didn't know what to do. Evidence that the public didn't know about was a knife sheet left behind likely by the killer. It was found partly under Madison Mogan's body and the comforter on her bed. On the snap of that knife sheet was DNA. So investigators had DNA from the crime scene, and they took the DNA and they ran it through the National Crime Database, and there were no hits, no matches. When and how this DNA got there, I'm not at all worried about the DNA. Last night, in conjunction with the Pennsylvania State Police, Federal Bureau of Investigation, detectives arrested 28-year-old Brian Christopher Kohlberger in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, on a warrant for murder of Ethan, Madison, and Kaylee. Mr. Kohlberger was taken into custody without incident. The scene was turned over to the FBI evidence response team for processing. According to a Monroe County, Pennsylvania prosecutor, when SWAT arrived at the family home of Brian Kohlberger, they found him standing in his parents' kitchen at 1.30 in the morning. Kohlberger was found awake uh, in the kitchen area, uh, dressed in shorts and a shirt and wearing um, latex uh, medical type gloves and apparently was taking his personal trash and putting it into separate Ziploc baggies. The DNA found on the knife sheath under Madison Mogan's body was the piece of the puzzle investigators needed. Three days before Koberger's arrest, detectives used trash from Koberger's parents' home for a DNA sample that turned out to be a match to the suspected killer's father. Imagine what happens when you're finally able to get the results of the DNA sample that you pull from the father. You can just hear the champagne popping. This is a quad murder. That has to be elation in that squad room, in that war room, when they're sitting together and they're looking at each other and going, we got this guy. We've got this guy. 
after Brian Koberger was taken into custody in Pennsylvania, he met with an attorney who said publicly that Koberger told him he believed that he would be exonerated. He is very intelligent. Uh, in my hour conversation with him, that comes off. Uh, I can tell that. Uh, and he understands where we are right now. Hey, Brian, how are you doing? How are you feeling? How's it going, Brian? Even though Brian Koberger wasn't fighting extradition, he still had to appear in a Pennsylvania courtroom. I was inside of that courtroom when he walked in and everyone was able to see him for the first time. Uh, his mother broke down into tears. The Koberger family, they were sitting on the front row of that courtroom. He made sure to make that eye contact with them and he kept looking at them. Big breaking news, folks, just moments ago. Here it is, the arrival of the accused killer in Idaho. It was quite a scene when Koberger arrived back in Idaho. He was taken off the plane in Pullman and put into a pickup truck, and then a caravan of law enforcement vehicles drove him into the Latal County Jail parking lot where media and even members of the public were outside waiting for him. The next time we saw him would be in a courtroom. The maximum penalty for that offense, if you plead guilty or are found guilty, is up to death and or imprisonment for life. Do you understand? Yes. Unlike in his Pennsylvania appearance, where Koberger looked back to see his family in the courtroom, he seemed to make a point in Idaho not to do so, likely because he knew the victim's families would be in the gallery. I feel like he's scared to look at me in the eyes and start to understand what's about to happen to him. You know, he picked the wrong family. So once the suspect appears in court, prosecutors release the probable cause affidavit, and this stuff is filled with detail after detail after detail, things we didn't know, 18 pages worth. And at that point, the public got some answers. But more importantly, the families finally got some answers. You read the affidavit and you just find out that nobody understands exactly why, but he was stalking them, he was hunting them. The affidavit in this case lays out the evidence against Brian Koberger, but there is a gag order here, so we don't know everything the prosecution has. But a lot of people think he's the guy, he must be guilty. But there's a long way to go, and a lot of people think that this case isn't a slam dunk. It's absolutely disgusting. Uh, this guy does not have a presumption of innocence. He has the assumption of guilt. I'm Sarah Azari. I'm a criminal trial attorney in Los Angeles. I'm currently a legal analyst for News Nation, and I am the host of the Presumption podcast. You know, a pretrial convictions of high-profile defendants and high-profile cases is nothing new, but Koberger is a whole other level. And I think not only we found him guilty of slaying the four Idaho students, but we've decided that he's going to get the death penalty. The most significant piece of evidence for prosecutors is the DNA of the defendant found on the knife sheath of the alleged murder weapon located underneath victim Madison Mogan's body. We don't know when and how this DNA got there. So if Brian Koberger is person A and he touches this knife sheath and then somehow this knife sheath is picked up by somebody else, I mean, he could touch it, he could handle it, it could be anything. And then that person then somehow is in this King's Road home that is a perfect explanation of how Koberger's DNA was on that knife sheet. Is insufficient to place him in that home, let alone to place the murder weapon in his hands. That's why I'm not at all worried about the DNA. I'm Tiffany Roy, and I'm a forensic DNA expert. I work privately in the area of forensic DNA and forensic biology. I've been doing this work for 17 years. DNA can be transferred onto items that people have never contacted and never touched. It can be found in rooms where people have never set foot. He may never have touched that sheath and his DNA could have been transferred there by some contact with another item or another person. 
We can't tell how it got there. We can't tell when it got there. Or it could be there because he committed this quadruple murder and took the lives of these four students. And maybe when he was closing the snap, his thumb touched before he even showed up at the murder scene. And maybe that knife sheath got loose because those girls were fighting for their lives. Now, you take that evidence in conjunction with all the other evidence, including those phone records, wow. Investigators believe that Koberger's cell phone was off or in airplane mode around the estimated time of the murders because he turned it off. We've been saying it was off, his phone was off. We don't know if it was off. It could have been off, it could have been in airplane mode, or it could have just simply not picked up signal during that time. What's odd, of course, and what's problematic for the defense is that his phone did pick up signal before the murders and after the murders. Another significant coincidence, for those who believe in coincidences, I don't, is that there's this white car that's driving around and around at the time of the murders, close to the scene of the murders, caught on video. And guess what? The defendant, the suspect, the accused, what does he drive? A white Elantra. The car is driving around, but then suddenly, during the window of the murders, we don't know where this car was. We don't know where it was parked. We just know nothing about the car. Identification of the Hyundai Elantra as, like, the suspect vehicle, that's a problem. Another part of the case against Brian Koberger is an eyewitness account. Dylan Mortensen, one of the surviving roommates, she told police that she saw a man around the time of the murders dressed in black, bushy eyebrows, wearing a mask covering his nose and his mouth that walked past her down the hallway. And then we have Dylan, surviving roommate, as she's so afraid that she goes in her back in her bedroom and locks herself up and then doesn't call 911 for eight hours later. Okay, that is highly unusual. We look to expected behavior, expected response, reasonable response. That is what makes sense to jurors. Jurors are normal people. So you tell them a story, it better make sense, right? And it doesn't make sense. Credibility always matters with witnesses. And this witness comes across as credible. Is she flawed? Yes. Next, the house on King Road. No one of us is here right now. And the type of person capable of committing these murders. Whoever did this, be it Koberger or someone else, is a sexual domination killer. Plus, Brian Koberger's defense. If he says, I was in this house before, that's why my DNA is in this house. All of a sudden, you might have a completely different trial. Okay, and then one other follow-up. Um, I know you said when the call came in, it was for an unconscious per person, and also that was a stabbing. It seems, just from an outside perspective looking in, like that would be um, not the first thing a, a person calling in would think. You're right. Um, but the report that we got was that it was an unconscious individual. It wasn't until our officers arrived on scene, um, went in to do um, caregiving check on the individual who was unconscious that we um, found the scene that we found. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Heather Roberts with ABC News. Just to follow up on what she asked, so the other two roommates were there at the time of the attack? All the information that we have from our investigation is that yes, they were. Okay, but they were unhurt. That is correct. So is there any explanation as to why it took so long then for someone to call 911? You have surviving witnesses to an incident at three or four in the morning and the 911 call didn't come until noon? I don't think I ever said that they were witnesses. I said they were there. Um, so, you know, we don't know why that call came in at noon and not um, in the middle of the night. Um, would have we loved for that to have happened? Yes, but that, that's not how it took place. So um, we're, that's why we're investigating everything still to try to pull all the pieces together. Were they one of the people, were, were they the 911 caller? Um, at this point in time, um, 
I'm not going to divulge who our 911 caller is um, just because I want to keep the um, integrity of the investigation at this point, okay? Okay. And last question, are you able to tell whether the same weapon was used on all four victims? You know, that's why we're having the autopsies done. The autopsy will confirm that and hopefully collect um, some evidence for us, um, even from, from those. That's why you do um, the autopsies is to try to be thorough and try to gather more. So um, we'll leave that. That, that. that would probably be something that would come out later. Okay. Uh, so there were, oh, sorry, I'm Emma Epperly with this book's Hi. interview. Hi. Um, so there were other uh, roommates who lived at that, at that residence. Um, were the roommates home at the time of the attack? Uh, there was, um, there was other people home at that time, but we're not just focusing just on them. We're focusing on everybody that um, may be coming and going from that residence. So since they were home, was it a hostage situation? No, it was not. Um, and then did... Um, they didn't call it into police, so were they um, injured? They were not injured, um, but like I said, we're still following up with everybody that um, could have been in that area. And how can you say it's a uh, targeted attack if um, you don't have a suspect? Like I said, we take the totality of the situation, we try to make the best um, bit of information we can with everything that comes in and then we make our decision off of that. So at this time, I'm not gonna expand upon that. Um, but like I've said, we do have a suspect out somewhere and we are looking for that individual to uh, solve this. Street where I've lived the past two years and I really like just hanging out with my friends all the time and being super involved in school events and everything else. So yeah, that's just a little bit about me and I'm really excited to take on this course.